First Love How old was I then? Eleven or twelve years? More probably thirteen, for before then is too early to be seriously in love. But I won't venture to be certain, considering that in southern countries the heart matures early, if that organ is to blame for such perturbations. If I do not remember well when, I can at least say exactly how, my first love revealed itself. I was very fond, as soon as my aunt had gone to church to perform her evening devotions, of slipping into her bedroom and rummaging her chest of drawers, which she kept in admirable order. Those drawers were to me a museum. In them, I always came across something rare or antique which exhaled an archaic and mysterious scent, the aroma of the sandalwood fans which perfumed her white linen, pin cushions of satin now faded, knitted mittens carefully wrapped in tissue paper, prints of saints, sewing materials, a reticule of blue velvet embroidered with bugles, an amber and silver rosary would appear from the corners. I used to ponder over them and return them to their place, but one day, I remember as well as if it were today, in the corner of the top drawer, and lying on some collars of old lace, I saw something gold glittering. I put in my hand, unwittingly crumbled the lace, and drew out a portrait, an ivory miniature, about three inches long, in a frame of gold. I was struck at first sight. A sunbeam streamed through the window and fell upon the alluring form, which seemed to wish to step out of its dark background and come towards me. It was the most lovely creature, such as I had never seen except in the dreams of my adolescence. The lady of the portrait must have been some twenty-odd years. She was no simple maiden, no half-opened rosebud, but a woman in the full resplendency of her beauty. Her face was oval, but not too long, her lips full, half open and smiling. Her eyes cast a languishing side glance, and she had a dimple on her chin, as if formed by the tip of Cupid's playful finger. Her headdress was strange but elegant, a compact group of curls, plastered cone-wise, one over the other covered her temples, and a basket of braided hair rose on the top of her head. This old-fashioned headdress, which was trussed up from the nape of her neck, disclosed all the softness of her fresh young throat, on which the dimple of her chin was reduplicated more vaguely and delicately. As for the dress, I do not venture to consider whether our grandmothers were less modest than our wives are, or if the confessors of past times were more indulgent than those of the present. I'm inclined to think the latter, for seventy years ago women prided themselves on being Christian-like and devout, and would not have disobeyed the director of their conscience in so grave and important a matter. What is undeniable is that if in the present day any lady were to present herself in the garb of the lady of the portrait, there would be a scandal, for from her waist, which began at her armpits, upwards, she was only veiled by light folds of diaphanous gauze, which marked out, rather than covered, two mountains of snow, between which meandered a thread of pearls. With further lack of modesty, she stretched out two rounded arms worthy of Juno, ending in finely molded hands. When I say hands, I am not exact, for strictly speaking, only one hand could be seen and that held a richly embroidered handkerchief. Even today, I am astonished at the startling effect which the contemplation of that miniature produced upon me, and how I remained in ecstasy, scarcely breathing, devouring the portrait with my eyes. I had already seen here and there prints representing beautiful women. It often happened that in the illustrated papers, in the mythological engravings of our dining room, or in a shop window, that a beautiful face or harmonious and graceful figure attracted my precociously artistic gaze. But the miniature encountered in my aunt's drawer, a 
apart from its great beauty, appeared to me as if animated by a subtle and vital breath. You could see it was not the caprice of a painter, but the image of a real and actual person of flesh and blood. The warm and rich tone of the tints made you surmise that the blood was tepid beneath that mother-of-pearl skin. The lips were slightly parted to disclose the enameled teeth, and to complete the illusion there ran round the frame a border of natural hair, chestnut in color, wavy and silky, which had grown on the temples of the original. As I have said, it was more than a copy. It was the reflection of a living person, from whom I was only separated by a wall of glass. I seized it, breathed upon it, and it seemed to me that the warmth of the mysterious deity communicated itself to my lips and circulated through my veins. At this moment I heard footsteps in the corridor. It was my aunt returning from her prayers. I heard her asthmatic cough and the dragging of her gouty feet. I had only just time to put the miniature into the drawer, shut it, and approach the window, adopting an innocent and indifferent attitude. My aunt entered noisily, for the cold of the church had exasperated her catarrh, now chronic. Upon seeing me, her wrinkled eyes brightened, and giving me a friendly tap with her withered hand, she asked me if I had been turning over her drawers as usual. Then, with a chuckle, Wait a bit, wait a bit, she added, I have something for you, something you will like. And she pulled out of her vast pocket a paper bag, and out of the bag three or four gum lozenges, sticking together in a cake which gave me a feeling of nausea. My aunt's appearance did not invite one to open one's mouth and devour these sweets. The course of years, her loss of teeth, her eyes dimmed to an unusual degree, the sprouting of a mustache or bristles on her sunken in mouth, which was three inches wide, dull gray locks fluttering above her sallow temples, a neck flaccid and livid as the crest of the turkey when in a good temper. In short, I did not take the lozenges. Ugh! A feeling of indignation, a manly protest rose in me, and I said forcibly, I do not want it. I don't want it. You don't want it. What a wonder. You who are greedier than a cat. I am not a little boy, I exclaimed, drawing myself up and standing on tiptoes. I don't care for sweets. My aunt looked at me half good-humoredly and half ironically, and at last, giving away to the feeling of amusement I caused her, burst out laughing, by which she disfigured herself and exposed the horrible anatomy of her jaws. She laughed so heartily that her chin and nose met, hiding her lips and emphasizing two wrinkles, or rather two deep furrows, and more than a dozen lines on her cheeks and eyelids. At the same time, her head and body shook with the laughter, until at last her cough began to interrupt the burst, and between laughing and coughing, the old lady involuntarily spluttered all over my face. Humiliated and full of disgust, I escaped rapidly thence to my mother's room, where I washed myself with soap and water, and began to muse on the lady of the portrait. And from that day and hour I could not keep my thoughts from her. As soon as my aunt went out, to slip into her room, open the drawer, bring out the miniature, and lose myself in contemplation, was the work of a minute. By dint of looking at it, I fancied that her languishing eyes, through the voluptuous veiling, of her eyelashes were fixed in mine, and that her white bosom heaved. I became ashamed to kiss her, imagining she would be annoyed at my audacity, and only pressed her to my heart, or held her against my cheek. All my actions and thoughts referred to the lady. I behaved towards her with the most extraordinary refinement and super delicacy. Before entering my aunt's room and opening the long fur drawer, I washed, combed to my hair, and tidied myself, as I have seen since is usually done before repairing to a love appointment. I often happen to meet in the street other boys of my age, very proud of their slip of a sweetheart, who would exultingly show me love letters, photographs, and flowers, 
and who asked me if I hadn't a sweetheart with whom to correspond. A feeling of inexplicable bashfulness tied my tongue, and I only replied with an enigmatic and haughty smile. And when they questioned me as to what I thought of the beauty of their little maidens, I would shrug my shoulders and disdainfully call them ugly mugs. One Sunday I went to play in the house of some little girl cousins, really very pretty, the eldest of whom was not yet fifteen. We were amusing ourselves, looking into a stereoscope, when suddenly one of the little girls, the youngest, who counted twelve summers at most, secretly seized my hand, and in some confusion and blushing as red as a brazier, whispered in my ear, Take this. At the same time, I felt in the palm of my hand something soft and fresh, and saw that it was a rosebud with its green foliage. The little girl ran away smiling and casting a side glance at me, but I, with a puritanism worthy of Joseph, cried out in my turn, Take this! And I threw the rosebud at her nose, a rebuff which made her tearful and pettish with me the whole afternoon and for which she has not pardoned me even now, though she is married and has three children. The two or three hours which my aunt spent morning and evening together at church, being too short for my admiration of the entrancing portrait, I resolved at last to keep the miniature in my pocket, and went about all day hiding myself from people just as if I had committed some crime. I fancied that the portrait, from the depth of its prison of cloth, could see all my actions, and I arrived at such a ridiculous extremity that if I wanted to scratch myself, pull up my sock, or do anything else not in keeping with the idealism of my chaste love, I first drew out the miniature, put it in a safe place, and then considered myself free to do whatever I wanted. In fact, since I had accomplished the theft, there was no limit to my vagaries. At night I hid it under the pillow and slept in an attitude of defense. The portrait remained near the wall, I outside, and I woke a thousand times, fearing somebody would come to bereave me of my treasure. At last I drew it from beneath the pillow, and slipped it between my nightshirt and left breast, on which the following day could be seen the imprint of the chasing of the frame. The contact of the dear miniature gave me delicious dreams, the lady of the portrait, not an effigy, but in her natural size and proportions, alive, graceful, affable, beautiful, would come towards me to conduct me to her palace by a rapid and flying train. With sweet authority, she would make me sit on a stool at her feet, and would pass her beautifully molded hand over my head, caressing my brow, my eyes and loose curls. I read to her out of a big missal, or played the lute, and she deigned to smile, thanking me for the pleasure which my reading and songs gave her. At last, romantic reminiscences overflowed in my brain, and sometimes I was a page, and sometimes a troubadour. With all these fanciful ideas, the fact is that I began to grow thin quite perceptibly, which was observed with great disquietude in my parents and my aunt. In this dangerous and critical age of development, everything is alarming, said my father, who is used to read books of medicine, and anxiously studied my dark eyelids, my dull eyes, my contracted and pale lips, and above all, the complete lack of appetite which had taken possession of me. Play, boy, eat, boy, he would say to me, and I replied to him dejectedly. I don't feel inclined. They began to talk of distractions, offered to take me to the theater, stopped my studies, and gave me foaming new milk to drink. Afterwards, they poured cold water over my head and back to fortify my nerves, and I noticed that my father at table or in the morning when I went to his bedroom to bid him good morning would gaze at me fixedly for some little time, and would sometimes pass his hand down my spine, feeling the vertebrae. I hypocritically lowered my eyes, resolved to die rather than confess my crime. As soon as I was free from the affectionate solicitude of my family, I found myself alone with my lady of the portrait. 
At last, to get nearer to her, I thought I would do away with the cold crystal. I trembled upon putting this into execution, but at last my love prevailed over the vague fear with which such a profanation filled me, and with skillful cunning I succeeded in pulling away the glass and exposing the ivory plate. As I pressed my lips to the painting, I could scent the slight fragrance of the border of hair. I imagined to myself even more realistically that it was a living person whom I was grasping with my trembling hands. A feeling of faintness overpowered me, and I fell unconscious on the sofa, tightly holding the miniature. When I came to my senses, I saw my father, my mother, and my aunt, all bending anxiously over me. I read their terror and alarm in their faces. My father was feeling my pulse, shaking his head and murmuring. His pulse is nothing but a flutter. You can scarcely feel it. My aunt, with her claw-like fingers, was trying to take the portrait from me, and I was mechanically hiding it and grasping it more firmly. But, my dear boy, let go, you are spoiling it, she exclaimed. Don't you see you are smudging it? I'm not scolding you, my dear. I will show it to you as often as you like, but don't destroy it. Let go, you are injuring it. Let him have it, begged my mother. The boy is not well. Of all things to ask, replied the old maid. Let him have it. And who will paint another like this? Or make me as I was then? Today nobody paints miniatures. It is a thing of the past. And I also am a thing of the past. And I am not what is represented there. My eyes dilated with horror. My fingers released their hold on the picture. I don't know how I was able to articulate. You? The portrait? Is you? Don't you think I am as pretty now, boy? Bah! One is better looking at twenty-three than at... than at... I don't know what, for I have forgotten how old I am. My head drooped, and I almost fainted again. Anyway... My father lifted me in his arms onto the bed and made me swallow some tablespoons of port. I recovered very quickly and never wished to enter my aunt's room again. End of First Love by Amelia Pardo Bazan.